yeah, yeah. kind of yeah, armature and maybe to it's been occurring to me so much lately and teaching you see it all the time too but this which is Xenon paint yeah they all sold but uh, some of them are very cool yeah. Art Walk host Kelly Johnson. I'm the executive director of the Arts and Business Alliance of Eugene. We want to give a, again a special thanks to Holt Presents and the Jojo Abbott Residency for sponsoring this month's Art Walk. Jojo Abbott will be in Eugene January 22nd through 26th for immersive performances, two community workshops, and a culminating concert. And we'd also like to thank our media sponsor, KLCC. And I am very excited to be here. I'm fangirling a little bit because um, we have one of uh, Eugene's kind of prominent artists here, Adam Grzowski. And um, he's going to tell us a little bit about his show today and um, about himself. So um, let's hear from him. Oh, thank you. Hi, everybody. Thank you for so much for thank you so much for coming. Uh, it's a it's a pleasure always, and and uh, <laughs> uh, I have very little. I mean, planned to say. I was just hoping, actually, that you guys could just ask questions, and I could fire questions at me or whatever, and I can uh, I can do my best with. Uh, be before I got into into it, answering questions so I had a I just uh, you know it's been a long such a long strange trip when you 59 years old all of a sudden don't tell anybody but it's <laughs> yeah it just you know somebody said the other day that uh, the days are long and the years are short as you get older you know I mean it's just and I was thinking 30 33 years in this town and 11 years at the Xenon. Those of you, I see so many faces from the Xenon. I waited on everybody in this town and did a bunch of paintings this this time of the Xenon, actually, which is really, uh, I mean, there's just been so many, you know, and then people start dying, that, you know, when you get to this age, there's people are, aren't here anymore, and just the whole crazy uh, turnaround of, of humans. But this town has been so, supportive of me. I mean, uh, the big shout out I want to do is just thank all the, I mean, it's incredible. I mean, the number of paintings that people have bought in this town is, you know, when somebody in these income brackets spends $5,000 for a painting to put on their wall, I mean, that's cray cray. I mean, it's, <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, a, and it, it's just extremely, uh, Overwhelming, and I just, 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 I love everybody who supports me so much. And this town has been so good. And the other quickie to get in is that my, just my students at Lane. You know, another the years go by 28 years. You know, after 11 years at the Xenon, you know, I, I had two master's degrees. When I got out here, I thought I want to get a teaching job. That's all I was going to do was teach at the beginning. And you know, and then there were no jobs and there were no nothing. So you wait tables for 11 years, which was awesome actually. And uh, you know, and then got this, heard there was this job at Lane. I moved out here actually to get a job at Lane Community College. I heard of this guy, Bruce Dean, you know, that was this venerable 35 year professor at, you know, instructor at Lane was magical, you know, wonderful. And, uh, you know, then I got his job crazily out of it, you know, like one in a billion <laughs> chance. And uh, so it's just, it's been a, and, they, and my students are just the most, it's the best thing in the world. And there's so many people tonight, and I've got their kids, you know, I've people that I've, you know, they've been students, and their kids are my students, and their kids are my students. It's just, uh, well, I won't go that far, but. Yeah. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> but, uh, so it's just, uh, again, uh, and Lane, not to pitch, but, Lane is an amazing place and our department is so strong across the board. We have wonderful instructors and it's a it's a very it's a wonderful good it's a good one of the good things in the world is it's good. So uh, I just want to thank everybody across the board and uh, so hit me with your ask me something. What do you want to know? What did the circus content come from? 
the circus is an old, uh, because of the wire walking thing that I, you know, uh, got into from climbing, you know, I, way back when I was an undergrad and, you know, 18 years old or whatever, I just did all this research on the circus and then I, a lot of my prints from, my two master's degrees are in printmaking, so I spent, you know, like eight years screeching on copper plates, but, uh, before I started painting, but the circus has always been a, just a, you know, such a classic theme or whatever, but since we actually had a circus at Evergreen, they let, they let us, they, I had a 30 foot tight right, tightrope at Evergreen, they let, with no, no net, no nothing, times have changed, I mean, <laughs> nobody would let you do that shit these days, but, you know, it was, uh, so I just always, uh, then I kind of redid, just kind of resurfaced, it's been, a, this was kind of a weird show, the bullfighting thing, and then the circus thing, and then the landscape thing, but, uh, it's always been a, you know, as I think in the, reference that in the article in the paper, you know, I always just think about throughout history, you know, the people that have to invent themselves from nothing, you know, no money, poor, broke, you know, the whole history of the circus and Jews and acrobats and whatever, and, and plus, and the people in the, in, you know, all this research I did recently, I came across all these images of people doing the actual performance stuff that they're doing is, rather than the stuff people are doing today, and with no safety apparatus or whatever, it's just insane. You know, and again, I'm kind of learning about, trying to learn about the computer, and actually using the computer, which I hate, but, you know, just Google, you know, Russian circus from 18, you know, 1900, and it, it's crazy. People are just doing fascinating, but. That's, <laughs> yes, yes. So, um, your work seems to have a lot of narrative in there. Sorry, for me, it strikes me with the narrative of some kind that I've always tried to figure out. So, does that mostly come from the past, or does it come from the past? Well, that's a good question. I mean, I think, you know, when people make, when you make, sit down to paint or make images, you know, or make a pot or, you know, sculpt, uh, it's always kind of a subconscious narrative is coming out one way, whether you intend it to or not. You know, that was one fascinating thing when I, you know, after eight years of printmaking and studying with Lasansky and whatever, the last term at Iowa, I had to take an elective, so I took a painting class, you know, I was like, and I just knew as soon as I picked up a paintbrush, I was like, what the f was I doing? for eight years scratching on a plate, which is so prescribed and tight. And you know, when you start painting like stuff, it's, it's almost, sometimes it's a little, it's a little creepy or whatever. I mean, it's just stuff comes, stuff comes out that you have no, that you have no intention of. It just comes out, you know, which I, and you know, it's, it just kind of, things start painting themselves. You know, a lot of these, that weird, that weird circus painting, you know, that's, which is like, an hour over an old painting or whatever, but it's just stuff just kind of, you know, people appear, you know, that you don't know from your past or something, you know, a couple of these big heads or was originally, it's a Modigliani, it's a, you know, a photograph of Modigliani, but I, you know, then they, you know, in the middle of painting it, it becomes like my dead best friend from high school or whatever, you know, their faces just kind of show up, you know, it wasn't intentional, wasn't thinking about them, wasn't, you know, just to, so then there, you know, whether it's a, I mean, sometimes the narrative is prescribed and I'm intending to, obviously, the bullfighting things or whatever are just kind of a overt narrative, but I, I think the interesting thing about painting is the narrative that's not, <laughs> that comes out when you didn't expect it to. What else? Ask me something else. Do you have any kind of different approach in painting such large scale? Uh, well, it, it's really interesting, you know, that people always think, oh, A, it's really just the size of the brushes. A, big paintings are awesome because, you know, a lot of painting, especially for me now, is very uh, physical. I mean, there's a, a lot of swinging of the paint, and it, it literally has to do with just the mechanics of your body and getting, and so the bigger they are, the more you can, the more swing you can 
to drive more paint that way, so I love that. But really, a lot of times it's just the size of the, it's literally just these bigger brushes. You know, little paintings, like, you know, which drive me crazy now and I have to paint on a small scale. But, you know, it's the same amount of brush strokes and the same amount of work, it's just a little tiny painting and then, and they don't cost as much either. <laughs> so, <duh. laughs> yes? Think of the relationship between slacklining and painting, the risk in both? Uh, yeah, I mean, again, even doing this tonight, you know, the weird thing is, I mean, the physical dangerous things, the wire walking or whatever is, uh, I mean, it's something that I enjoy doing and uh, it's, but Painting is, and having shows and having to talk to people like you guys or whatever is, is so much scarier in terms of, I mean, you know, people forgetting, and, you know, it's just like teaching. I love teaching so much, you know, but I think I've been doing this for 28 years and every time a new class starts, the main thing, I'm like sweating like a something in a something, you know, and, and just terrified, you know, it's, it's so, uh, and you're just like, dude, you've been doing this forever, you can do this in your sleep or whatever, but, uh, uh, and particularly having to put a bunch of paintings out in front of people. I mean, it's just a... Uh, oh, speaking of which, what an idiot. Another person I forgot to mention is my lovely gallerist over here, who's like the best human being, and Han, and everybody, the whole staff. Uh, but I mean, part, yeah. Well, you know, people have a lot of mythology about the art world and painting and whatever it's a it's a business and it's a job and it's a you know and the amount of work that goes on I mean the painter can do the painting but uh, you know it took me a while to realize that how much the, the the selling part and the interacting with people it's a you know and plus there are a lot of snake assholes in the art world <laughs> I'm serious. I've been, I've been, I've been, I, you know, I've been ripped off for forty-five thousand dollars or whatever. I mean, people just steal your work or take off and don't pay you. Or there's a lot of sketchy things, and to have a, you know, just you get lucky on in life or whatever. You just find somebody. You know, find our whole journey together, all the stuff we've been through, and the, it's amazing. So she's a, she's a good one, <laughs> and the whole staff the bomb. <laughs> These paintings are great. Why are you so humble? <laughs> 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 uh, so, I mean, I didn't count, but I would, it seems to me that at least more than half your paintings are figures facing away from you. Oh, now here's a, yeah. here comes a big brain, here comes a big brain. <laughs> and I'm just wondering what, what's, what's your thought on that? Uh, you know, that's another kind of subconscious thing. The question was, you said he cleverly noticed that uh, a lot of, at least half the paintings, the figures are facing away. And, and my earliest paintings, when I first started painting, they, they were all like that. So little kids on the beach or a single figure on a beach facing away. I, you know, I don't know the answer to that really. I mean, I don't, it's not, it wasn't intentional, but I oftentimes do that and, you know, which is weird because you think about the painter is, is looking into the painting and the, and the, you know, and the, and the viewers are looking at the paintings and the paintings are supposed to be speaking out, you know, but there's something about the, you know, people walking away and then in life, I don't know if it's the, uh, and you can't see faces, you know, you can't see, they're not looking, they're not making eye contact with you, you know, it's a, uh, I don't know the answer to that, but it, 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 it shows up a lot, I mean, it wasn't a conscious thing either, you know, even the, uh, so, okay, get out of here, <laughs> thank you, thank you, thanks everybody again for coming out, it's wonderful, and I appreciate it. Feel free to look around some more if you'd like. We're going to go to our next stop in Eugene Real Estate at 100 East Broadway, and we'll start our interview at 6.30.
Howdy. Well, it's 2 o'clock, so I'd like to welcome you to the atrium and thank you for coming today. Uh, we have Joshua Caraco. Caraca? Caraca. Who's going to play an, an instrument from Western Africa, a kora, something I have never experienced before, so I'm really looking forward to this. Uh, Joshua has asked that I put some chairs around uh, if you, because I guess his instrument's a little bit soft. I'm not sure, I think the acoustics in here are pretty good, but uh, if, feel free to move around if you'd like to come in closer during the event if you're not feeling like you're hearing it well enough. But anyway, let's uh, welcome Joshua to the interview. but my, my teachers were, um, are. Uh, so, yeah, let's back up <laughs> and just do the entire intro <laughs> since we're here. This is a Kora. Kora is a 21-stringed West African harp, lute, bridge harp. Um, it's got two sides of strings and a bridge and a skin stretched over, a cow skin stretched over a giant gourd. Um, so, a big old pumpkin. No. Um, not actually, but effectively calabash um, and grow in those warm tropical areas. Can, uh, and then it's it's strung with fishing line, um, and traditionally maybe they were strung with guts or skins or something like that, but they've been using nylon fishing line for quite a while. Sometimes if they can't get a heavy enough one for the low ones, they'll braid it um, or weave it. Um, yeah, and of course traditionally played in West Africa um, in, in, in an ethnic group called the Mandeng, or Mandinka. Or there's a few different variations on that. Um, and the, they were originally musicians in West Africa. In, in actually, many of the ethnic groups there are, um, were a, a caste there, caste system. And it's not as serious anymore, of course, like I'm allowed to play for it, and I didn't grow up in the system, but at the same time, um, so much of the music is passed down through generations, and like some of the most famous core players today say they're like the 70th generation. Um, uh, yeah, <laughs> so, um, yeah, so a lot of the time the people who play are still mostly a, of that cast, and there's like, you know, only like five or six names of most, last names for most core players, are like Javate, and Sissoko, and Suso, and Huyate and Conte, and uh, these are, yeah, um, my teacher's names were Kui, uh, Baba Kuyate, and Karamo Suso, and Yakuba Sissoko, and Solo Sissoko. Uh, yeah, so I first started playing uh, when I studied abroad in college in Senegal in 2008, so I've been playing for about 10 years, and then I, and, and the first, First time I played, we I was living with a host family, and um, the first month I was there was Ramadan, and the day after is this big holiday, and they had traditional musicians, Jolly, come to their house and, and sing to the family, and they heard I was interested in the instrument, and one of them, they asked, my host family asked if one of them would give me lessons, and the guy who's playing chorus is like, well, I won't, my big brother will, uh, and I was about to be out there, and then I got back, and I didn't really totally know what I was doing, and um, eventually I was in the Bay Area where I grew up and I met a guy um, who lived in Oakland who had just moved from the Gambia and he grew up mostly in Mali. His mom was from Mali, his dad was from the Gambia and he grew up playing and he was only a few years older than me but he'd playing since... Well I asked him how long he was playing he's like, I don't remember. 
I mean, like, the kid had been playing since he was two years old. Uh, like, uh, there's, like, some video you can find if you look really hard at him winning a contest at, like, 14. Um, so, that was cool. Um, and... And that's what a chorus sounds like. So that's why I kind of got you closer. It was, like, the first time I heard chorus music was in our living room. Like, we were, they were just all around, and there were three guys singing and one guy playing chorus, and one of the guys just tapping on the chorus. I've never done this show standing up, so if I'm a little like, oh, I haven't tried this one before, it's we're doing new things. Um, and I'm just, I'm gonna play you some music now. Uh, you need to sit down, it's okay. No, I mean, it's good, the acoustics are nice, I can interact with you. Um, you know, I play a lot of shows like sitting in corners and like uh, bars and stuff, and this is this is nice. This is different. Um, so it's 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 thanks for thanks for coming out. It's a good thing. Any requests? <laughs> White <All right>. bird. <laughs> they say that. All right, we'll save that one. <laughs> It's funny because if any of you were like West African, you would be like, yeah, Glenjan. And I'd be like, all right, cool. Uh,
Um, so there's songs for great hunters and great warriors and great kings. And there's peace songs and there's love songs. And there's some little protest songs and all of the above. Uh, Yeah, I mean, I call that a protest song. Uh, there's one I know, well, a, a king, perhaps, <laughs> maybe. Uh, <coughs> the one I play, I, I play in a different tuning, and I, I don't know if in this short set I'll have time to tune to the other key. There are three, actually, well, there, there are like four traditional tunings. I'm playing in syllaba tuning. The, the other two I know are called tomorrow. Tamora and, and, and Sauta, but I really only play well in, in Sivala and Sauta. I would usually play in those, but I, I don't know if we'll get out of Sivala today, as we have a limited amount of time. Um, but I play other places, so, you know, plug. Uh, you can look me up on the internet, uh, follow me on my Facebook page, I guess is the best way at the moment, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, if you have that. Um, I teach lessons occasionally. Um, I'm playing at Saturday Market on, uh, sorry, at Holiday Market on the 24th, first thing off the bat. So if you're doing some shopping on November 24th at 10.30 in the morning, you can come <laughs> see me again. Uh, yeah, so this whole strap thing is new, seeing how that's working. Um, but uh, yeah, let's play some more music for you.
Y'all doing good out there? A little, a little more peace in your lives? <laughs> yeah. All right. Any requests yet? No? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Could you talk a little about your instrument? Ah, uh, yeah, I can do that. Uh, yeah, so Cora, if you are new, if you just came in, is a 21 string African harp of the Manding people. They come from countries like Senegal and Mali and Gambia, I think the Gambia and Guinea, so how can not agree? Um, and they pass their music down through generations. They keep oral histories and uh, stories, and they sing praises of people. and. Uh, <laughs> Sometimes, if you don't pay them, they might think, uh, say bad things about you. Uh, I'm not a jolly, so I'm not singing about you. So, the tip jar is strictly voluntary, but there is one. Uh, <laughs> over in the corner. Do you have any CDs? I don't have any CDs. <laughs> I have a small online presence. I may at some point have some CDs, but, um, but I do play other places, and I am like for hire for private events, and that's probably the coolest way to get all of me. I have cards. Um, but yeah, so the instrument is passed, yeah, it's been passed down for generations. This particular kora that I'm playing right now is built in Mali, actually by um, another guy who's not an African who I know who studied there, and his name's Gordon Hellingers, and he's like way better than I am, even um, or not even even. Anyway, he's probably the best like non-African horror player I I've played with personally, and he learned how to build this himself. And his teacher is named Maru Sidiki Javate, and he's the younger brother of Tumani Javate, who people may or may not have heard of. He tends oh, yeah. to be. <laughs> Some people say, "Oh yeah," I mean, he's the most famous in, in the world. Probably he was like the first horror player to have a Grammy. Um, but there's actually a couple of horror players who've gotten Grammys now. Um, so there, yeah, there's a rich. There's a lot of it. It's K-O-R-A is the most common spelling, and this instrument has a big variety and real richness out there. Um, I'm, I'm the best core player in Eugene, Oregon, and <laughs> pro pro probably the state of Oregon, but uh, if you get into California or uh, Washington even, I think, you'll find people who like, shred way harder than me, and if you get into West Africa, you'll find a lot of them, um, so it's really worth looking into. Um, but you have me here, and you can hear me live, so please, yeah. Um, yeah. So do you have a favorite piece that you play? Do I? No, it's more well, like the... request. Yeah, it's, no, it's an emotional thing, you know, it depends what mood I'm in. Um, I have some favorite pieces, but there's, there's, you know, there's a piece for everything. Uh, so, but there is, there's one that's not exactly my favorite per se, but I, I, it's the newest thing I've learned. There was a traditional thing, and it's the first thing I've learned like fairly well from just listening to a few recordings, which is like pretty hard, um, but like at some point you kind of mess with it and you're like, I have no idea what's going on, and then eventually something maybe just clicks, and 10 years ago I wouldn't have been able to do that, and so, and I don't have, my teachers all live really far away, so, <laughs> I haven't, you know, had any time to uh, learn as much, and that's led to like more, like doing Motown covers and writing songs. But I was really excited to learn this one called Salimu, um, and I, I can't tell you the meaning or the story behind it. But I'm, but yes, at the moment, this is one I'm really enjoying playing.
for? Traditionally, traditionally men play and women sing. Uh, but that's changing uh, both because there's a lot of foreign women who want to play and also because um, there are starting to be African women who play too. There's a famous horror player named Sonia Njibate who I think she lives in England at the moment, but she's from the Gambia and uh, is kind of like the first woman in her family to be allowed to play. Um, yeah, when I played with the symphony chorus, we had um, two, two, two women chorus players in that eight group of eight. Um, one of them's awesome, her name's Unity, she lives in Hawaii, but neither of them were African. Um, but yeah. That's wonderful. Yeah. Thank you, Joshua. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh,